When we first started Brooklyn Deli, I feel like there was kind of like this notion, and I mean, still today in some some parts of the country too, in that when you're looking at ethnic foods, a lot of people feel like for it to be authentic, it has to be cheap. And I think that Brooklyn Deli is dispelling that whole notion. Um, and I and for us, it's really in the data. You're listening to CPG Launch Leaders, the show where we interview new product trailblazers. Get ready for inspiration and secrets from the front lines of CPG innovation. Now here are our hosts, Darcy Ramler and Alan Peretz. Welcome to CPG Launch Leaders. I'm Alan Peretz and I'm here with my co-host Darcy Ramler. With us today is Chitra Agarwal, the founder of Brooklyn Deli a product that started from a family recipe and is now making its way to shelves across the country. Chitra, we're beyond excited to hear how you built your team as the brand scaled and the thoughtful process of creating your unmistakable product branding aesthetics. Before we dive in, we love to start each episode with one particular question. Currently, what new product has caught your attention in the marketplace? Thank you for having me. And One product that I'm pretty obsessed with right now are uh, sun noodles. It's basically this ramen kit um, that you can get in, I think it's frozen or refrigerated, but they basically built their name by providing some of the best ramen restaurants around the world with handmade noodles. And they recently uh, went to a grocery with the offering and my whole family is obsessed with it, including my kids, which is very hard to get everybody on the same page. <laughs> Ramen is a Brit of my children <laughs> as well, Chitra. So I, I am going to have to try that. And I did the other night, not noodles, but I made homemade ramen. So this may be what I need to add to the recipe. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> so every brand has a story. Can you tell us a little bit about the origin story for your brand, which is which is pretty unique? Yeah, so um, well, I, I feel like, like a lot of other CPG food brand owners, uh, we didn't know what we were getting into. Um, so I um, actually uh, was working in marketing when I started to blog about my family's recipes. Um, and I think that at the time I was blogging when I was living in Brooklyn and I felt like there was like a very cool scene, like a food scene going on that was apart from the restaurant scene. There was a lot of home cooks that were serving food at markets and just like teaching cooking classes. And there was all these like really cool supper clubs. And I kind of got swept up in that whole community. And from writing, I connected with a lot of people that were also interested in um, food and just, uh, you know, creating new recipes. And so I started teaching cooking classes. Um, I hosted a number of pop-up dinners. And then eventually, um, I was still working a job in marketing while I was doing all of it. Um, I uh, eventually got offered to write a cookbook. Um, and I think at that point, it was um, kind of, I guess, made clear to me that what I was doing as a hobby was something that I wanted to do full time. And kind of at the same time, the cookbook was kind of going on. Um, I had met my now who's my husband, <laughs> my boyfriend at the time, who is a food packaging designer. So he had done packaging for, you know, really large brands like like cereal boxes, like basically total Cheerios, like all these really huge iconic brands. And he loved what I was doing just like for Indian food and offered to, you know, (laughs) launch a brand with me. Um, And we created Brooklyn Deli together and I still um, develop all the recipes and he still designs all the packaging. And we really started um, with me making all of our condiments by hand in a soup pantry in Brooklyn and then selling them at markets throughout the city. And I started with a char, which is a very traditional Indian condiment. Um, and we basically introduced it to, um, you know, at the, the Brooklyn flea at all these different markets all over the city. And then specialty food buyers got interested. And then eventually national retailers um, got interested in the products. So and now we're we're um, distributed all throughout the U.S. That's a great story. So you you had this marketing background and your husband had these design chops, incredible design chops. 
Do you think you would have made the leap into entrepreneurship without all that background? Um, I don't. Well, I feel like I wouldn't have made the leap if I hadn't met Ben, really, because I'm a really risk averse person. <laughs> and, um, you know, I had a stable job with a paycheck and benefits. And I feel like it was um, if I, really if I hadn't met him, I don't think that I would have taken that leap. I think that we together made what Brooklyn Deli is. Um, it's really kind of, I guess it's that sum of parts, you know what I mean? It's like. <laughs> Absolutely. And can you talk a little bit about the origin of the name, where it came from, how you guys landed on that? And then we'll get into a little bit more about this amazing design and brand is so distinctive as well. Um, yeah. So the blog that I was writing was called the ABCDs of cooking, which I feel like if you are South Asian, you know what ABCD means. It's It stands for American Born Confused Desi. So it's basically someone like me that, you know, grew up in the US, but is of South Asian descent. And so that was the whole kind of premise behind my blog and the, the kind of food that I was creating. It was really for me how to kind of delve into my identity as an Indian American through food. But I guess the name wasn't that, you know, universal or <laughs> understood. So Brooklyn Deli kind of really was a way to kind of communicate that idea. Um, and it was very personal still because I was doing all the work in Brooklyn and my father is from Delhi. So it kind of really kind of pushed together these two worlds that I was a part of or am a part of still. <laughs> So the concept and design of Brooklyn Deli is very distinctive. How has it evolved as your product line has expanded? So in the beginning, it was very much focused on, I remember when Ben and I were still working, we were working on kind of what the brand was going to look like. And I had a number of these photos from when I had been visiting India that were of these storefronts that were um, hand painted and then also of truck art. So if you've been to India and you, uh, you, you may know this, but there are amazing, amazing like artists that draw and paint on the trucks that are in India. And it's like this kind of like, um, it's so iconic. It's just um, really amazing. So I had taken a lot of photos of those types of um, art pieces. And so I had kind of shown those to Ben as well as like just the, um, you know, the signage, the store signage. And he kind of like took that and ran with it and also mashed together what a Brooklyn Deli I like awning looks like. And so that's where we came up with the logo for Brooklyn Deli and also kind of like the packaging. Um, so those were, they were all nods to uh, kind of both, uh, both places in a sense. Um, and I think that as time has gone on, I feel like we have developed more and more products. So, you know, the condiments were the first piece and then we started to, to work on simmer sauces. And the thing about our simmer sauces is that that they're all plant-based. And instead of using butter or cream, we use um, like this really nice coconut cream. And so um, Ben kind of took this amazing coconut leaf pattern. And um, that was basically kind of uh, the design that came about for our simmer sauces. What an amazing story behind it. I know you've taken a very deliberate and organic approach to growth. Um, can you share a little bit more about that and how it impacts retail relationships with Whole Foods and others? Yeah, I mean, I guess for us, it's that I I worked for, you know, over a decade um, for somebody else. I always had a boss. And I think that with Brooklyn Deli, it's so personal to my story that I have been committed to figuring out how I can basically still have ownership over that vision. Um, and we have been lucky in the sense that we've been able to bootstrap this business and, and continue without having to take outside funding. Um, but at the same time, it means that we grow at our own pace. And I think that um, it's as of now, that's basically where, where we're at. Um, because 
I get to figure out, you know, a, a day in any day, it's like I get to figure out what I want to work on. I could work on my blog right now because I do a lot of recipe development, right? I don't have anybody telling me that, you know, <laughs> that's like maybe not what you should be working on. But at the end of the day, it's like if I had a boss, I, I almost feel like, um, it's like, what, what's the reason that I started Brooklyn Deli in the first place? It was basically to have ownership over um, what we put out at Brooklyn Deli and what I worked on here. Um, and so that's kind of what we've so far where, where we're at. I don't know if like a few years from now, I'm going to be like, oh my God, I really need a lot more money. Um, but uh, for now, I feel like um, it's good. And for me, it's just that I'm just like, I can't even believe that I can make a living doing something that I love. And um, I'm me and Ben are kind of like, simple people in that, like, I probably spend most of my money on food. Um, anyway, so <laughs> it's like, this is perfect for me. Market research, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I know the hard hard part in that kind of model, of course, is the inventory. Um, but it sounds like you guys have done a good job kind of uh, managing that growth in a way that allows you to hit scale. Right. I mean, we borrow money from banks, right? So it's like, the, that's, that's the other piece is that um, it, the, the percent, I mean, an interest rate is a lot different than giving somebody a percentage of your company too. And a bank is not going to tell me what to do. That's <laughs> true. That's true. Absolutely. So the, I, you know, as you said, this story and your founder story from starting in blogging and recipes and making that transition from hand making products in your kitchen and then scaling up to co-manufacturing. And there's so much when you start co-manufacturing from ingredients and combinations, it must have been quite a significant change for you guys. How did you guys start to, you know, specific recipes and especially, you know, venturing into culturally influenced recipes have, you know, ensuring the quality and authenticity becomes highly important. Can you kind of walk us through how you maintain that process, scaling from a kitchen all the way to co-manufacturing? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great question. I feel like when I first developed the recipes, it was in my home kitchen, right? And I was making a lot of these condiments and selling them at pop-up dinner. So it was like very small scale. Um, and then the next phase was going to a commercial kitchen. And um, I'd say that even from going from just like my pot at home to a braising pan in a soup pantry, that was eye opening because our first product was our tomato achar. And I just remember looking at that, you know, at the commercial kitchen, having it boil in this kettle. And I was like, oh my God, it's like lava. And I have to put it into a jar now. And it's like, you know, it's a kind of like a scary thing to be like, <laughs> to, to go from like such a small amount to then even going to um, what, what, you know, is not even that, that large of an amount. And I'd say that um, for us, when we scaled up and did go to a co-packer, um, it was really, it, it was tough for me because I didn't want to give up a lot of that control. Right. So it's like, I could see every piece of it. And what we had to do is we found co a co-packer that was able to work with the recipe that we had and allowed us to still source all of our ingredients. And I think that has been important for us because I feel like a lot of co-packers that we did talk to, they wanted to kind of have that they wanted to own the sourcing piece of it. And I think that's kind of a way for them to kind of drive down their own costs by maybe, um, you know, sourcing ingredients that would not be as high quality as, as we use in our, in our, in our products. And so that's been kind of um, a big piece of the products that we put out is that we still own all the sourcing. Absolutely. And then if you, you allow, you know, sometimes if you give up that power to your point, Chitra, is you can get variations in how it's tasting and the flavors and so forth. So maintaining that, and especially as you're going the route of more organic growth, maintaining that consistency for your consumers is really vital. Right, exactly. And I also think that even scaling up to larger kettles for how we make our product actually ended up in a product that I felt tasted better in a sense, because it was kind of just like this even heat. And it, it was just 
I, I, like I, I was like very surprised when we first did our first um, kind of trial runs. Um, I was blown away actually at, at how how good it tasted. Speaking of growth, uh, growing a team is really one of the big challenges that entrepreneurs faced. Uh, you know, I remember hiring my first employee in a, in a new business. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey and how you've decided what roles to fill internally versus outsourcing or partnering? Right. So I feel like for us, we've always looked at it like, what is it that I can do really well myself? And like, let's keep that in house. And what is it that I'm not good at? Like finance and ops. <laughs> and that's where we outsource. So um, I have, you know, I have grown our team very, um, very slowly in that sense, because, um, you know, then again, like working capital cash flow is an issue for us. So I have to make sure that every person that I bring on is going to bring value for us. So um, I'd say ops was the first piece that um, we started um, hiring. And even to this day, I mean, like we don't have anybody that is Full time. Everybody that we work with is a freelancer. So, um, and and some of them prefer that because I feel like they may. It just gives them flexibility too, right? So, and and that's something that we are upfront with um, anybody that does work with us. Um, and as of now, this is how it's working. Um, but for instance, so we brought in ops. So I have three people that work with us on, on ops at Brooklyn Deli. Um, and then the next piece was marketing. So I come from the marketing side. So I hired people that kind of like were specialists in what they do. So like I hired a content creator and then I hired um, someone that does performance marketing and then um, someone that's kind of like uh, just learning how to do marketing that I can kind of manage and, and teach um, who helps us with our influencer marketing. So I feel like we've kind of been very, you know, step by step um, is kind of how we've worked. And then we have a fractional sales team that we work with and um, like an accountant and bookkeeper. Um, so that's basically kind of what our team looks like. And you're kind of the hub of the wheel that connects all those people together. That's me. I'm the boss. <laughs> Well, Brooklyn Deli's products are premium quality Indian products. As you've grown and your retail shelf presence has grown as well, how have you navigated the challenges and opportunities of introducing higher price points in this international aisle or shelf space? Yeah. So I think that, so when we first started Brooklyn Deli, I feel like there was kind of like this notion and I mean, still today in some, some parts of the country too, in that when you're looking at ethnic foods, a lot of people feel like for it to be authentic, it has to be cheap. And I think that Brooklyn Deli is dispelling that whole notion. Um, and I and for us, it's really in the data. And so that's what we go to for when we do sell through our products is that you, you look at a category, for instance, like um, like pasta sauce, right? When I was growing up, it was like ragu and prego, right? It was like ragu was kind of the bottom line. Prego is like a little bit, a little bit above that. Let's see, let's be clear. It was like a level up in my years when I was a kid. We were a ragu family. <laughs> yeah. No, my parents were ragu and we like, but they would add a ton of spices to it. So they would add like chilies and like all this stuff. There were no carb bones though. There were none of those. Yeah. Right. And so like the Reyes and Carbones came and it it's it worked, right? Because there was still this customer that was looking for a premium product. And I think that's where Brooklyn Deli also is we're following suit with those brands, basically. And we're making a case for it by the numbers, basically. Now. So discovery is obviously critical to any growing brand. Can you tell us a little bit about marketing and, and how you approach that? Um, I think from the beginning, because I come from a blogging background, it's always been about education through recipes. And for us, it's that like, especially with the achars, those two, the, like we have a tomato achar and a garlic achar. Um, and those are very staple South Asian condiments, but a lot of um, Americans don't know what an achar is. It's basically this really spicy, you know, savory, sour condiment that 
all South Asians just add a little bit to their meal and it kind of just transforms it. And so for me, I love mixing just you know, fusion recipes. And so like from the outset, we created all of this content around how to use the achars in all these different ways. So, I mean, on our social, like we're really active on Instagram and TikTok, and we have a blog that has tons of recipes. And we also send emails out to customers weekly. Um, And so that's kind of the way that we look at social media is to um, like one piece of it is to, to really educate people on how how to use uh, the products that we make. And I think the other piece is that we're really using Brooklyn Deli as a platform to celebrate South Asian culture and our people. And so we use the platform to also, um, you know, showcase a lot of talent coming from the South Asian um, community. Um, And I feel like that has been really resonating with our, with our audience as well. And I think there's such a, as you're saying, there's such an educational part to what you're what you're providing in bringing in such a cultural influence and bringing Indian food, but bringing it together with that American consumer. How can they utilize it? It's not just the traditional ways. Um, you know, there's other ways that they can implement it and and incorporate it into recipes. Um, within that, have you seen even from the start? of really you formulated your company, have you seen a change? You know, I was just at Expo West and you're starting to see so much more influence and flavors and international flavors coming into the marketplace. Do you feel that's influenced really the trajectory of your company? I definitely think so. And I think that for us, um, a lot of interest in our products also kind of took off during the pandemic too. And it's just this, um, and which is cool in a sense, uh, even though it was like a very, you know, it, w- it was a tough situation um, for a lot of us that people just wanted to discover new things to cook with at home. And I think that for a lot of people, that interest stayed with them. And I feel like we brought, we got a lot of customers during that time that discovered a char and we still get emails that are like, Oh my God, like you helped us through that time. Everything was so boring. And then we, we found your condiments. And I feel like that um, the more people kind of like discovered us there, but also people are just, discovering global flavors through social in such a huge way that like everybody's on, I mean, like, yeah, like my parents are on social media, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, everybody's kind of like, like learning about and really curious to try all of these different things that they see, um, like see on their screens, basically. Hi, Jesse. What brings you to the airport? Mike, I'm off to the headquarters to share an update on the big launch. Oh, I've heard it's selling really well. Care to share your secret? Well, just between us, it's all thanks to Bold Labs. Their exclusive digital test market research allows you to optimize your product, marketing, and pricing before the big launch. That sounds fantastic. How can I learn more? Just visit www.boldlabs.com. It's all right there. This is the final call for flight 723 to Chicago. Looks like we'd better go. Thanks for the tip, Jesse. See you soon, Mike. And remember, Bold Labs is ready to help your product soar. We know growing a company, it has its great moments and it has its unexpected moments as well. What are some of the lessons you feel that you've learned? This can be either through entrepreneurship, the food industry, personal lessons as well. But, you know, we know it's there's always those unexpected ones. Is there any that you would that stand out to you? Gosh, I have a lot of lessons um, that I've learned. Um, But I'd say like one of the most important ones is that I think in the beginning that when I would make a mistake or something would go wrong, I'd just like freak out about it. And like now I kind of look at it as just a learning moment and um, like try to keep my cool as best I can. But it's just that in this business that a lot of it is basically trial by fire. And uh, each time you kind of run into a situation, it makes you that much more prepared when it comes up again. And so that's kind of what I've learned is that you really just, you don't, you don't know what's going to happen in a day and you have to be ready to just be okay with what, (laughs) you know, what comes about. 
Yeah. And when you say trial by fire, also, as you've kind of expanded or you think about the next steps of where you're headed, how do you how do you approach that as a brand and obviously a very lean team of, of two that are are working in that day to day? How do you guys approach what is the next step for the brand? Where is the portfolio expanding to? For us, I feel like it's that you know, we we definitely want to be the premier like Indian brand at, at that premium level. But I also feel like we have learned that we have to go also where our customer is to some degree. So that means that we are not going to go after opportunities that may look great to say that we're in X retailer when it may not make sense for our brand or where we're at right now. Um, and so we're really um, specific about the types of retailers that we work with and who we want, um, who, where we think our customers are, basically. Which retailers, just as you think about the top ones, can you give us some examples? Uh, so we're in Whole Foods nationwide. We are in the fresh market. We are in... Um, trying to think we're we're in like a lot of still like natural specialty um, markets and we do have a great relationship also with Blue Apron. So that was actually a, 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 an amazing partnership for us that helped to educate more people about what a char is uh, because they were able to kind of put it in all of these different recipes and it was a way for us to sample our char to millions of homes basically. I was going to say, it's a great awareness play, but at the same token, it goes back to your roots of how you started blogging with recipes and kind of that connection is, is a very beautiful connection because it, it, it brings a story full circle. <laughs> right. And the funny part was, is that I used to teach cooking classes in Brooklyn and at Brooklyn Kitchen. And one of the people that I worked with there went to Blue Apron and she's the one that helped to bring the achar into Blue Apron. So it was like, oh, it is real full circle. <laughs> so, so I've got a two part question here. First part is um, I'm going to Whole Foods later this afternoon. What should I pick up uh, just to try your brand and, and maybe a, a few items? And then what should I expect on the shelves in the future? Like, what are you working on today that, that you want to share with us or can share with us? So I'd say if you're going to Whole Foods, definitely pick one of our simmer sauces and to make it authentic add one of our chars to it too. So it's like, say you got our tikka masala, you would make like a chicken tikka masala or a tofu tikka masala, and then add a spoon of our garlic achar or a tomato achar to the finished dish. And you'll be very happy. <laughs> well, I'm a spice lover. I'll probably use half a jar of achar. <laughs> Um, and we are going to be launching uh, quite a few new products this year. Um, I'll just say that they are um, they're going to make making Indian food at home a lot easier. And we have six new products that we'll be launching um, nationwide at Whole Foods this year. Oh, well, that's intriguing. Very exciting. So finally, you know, for other entrepreneurs that are out there and are listening, looking to make their mark in the CPG industry, especially those bringing new cultural cultural flavors to the table, what advice would you give based on your experience with your brand? I'd say that community is everything. I don't think that I would have been able to get off the ground with this business as fast as I did without connecting with other CPG founders. Um, I was lucky because I had been working in food before and selling food at market. So I met a lot of people in food that were a little bit ahead of me because they then went from prepared foods to starting their own um, CPG companies. And so I leaned on my community heavily when I first began. And a lot of those um, same people have become just like my best friends. Like they, they came to my wedding or, you know, and so I'd say that um, definitely connecting with community and um, not, not like launching your brand in a silo, um, but really seeking out um, information and um, building a community um, before you, you launch. 
Absolutely. Well, Chitra, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about Brooklyn Deli and the story that really exists around your brand. Your story is rich with insights into building a brand with authenticity, navigating the challenges of scaling, and the importance of thoughtful approach to team building and product development. It is stories like yours that remind us to keep innovating, stay inspired, and let's continue to redefine the world of CPG innovation. We appreciate you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for joining. So coming out of that episode, I always think it's interesting. You know, we've covered major launches from major brands to really, as she said, starting from her kitchen and with a concept and idea and taking it all the way into now a CPG brand that is has full distribution with Whole Foods. You know, as we think about that and we address challenges, there's so many learnings that can take place along the path. She really focused on, focused on knowing social media, blogging, bringing that into. Would love to hear a little bit of your thoughts on how that's important to incorporate with brands these days. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I was thinking about the same thing, right? Like we meet a lot of entrepreneurs who just had a vision and, and an idea. Um, but maybe they didn't have any background at all, and they end up being successful. And then you then you speak to people like Chitra, who you know was a was a trained marketer and had a husband doing package design. I think ultimately it comes down to passion and persistence. I'm sure those things helped her out, but I bet you even without them, just after talking to her, she would have been successful. It is an interesting, you know, having that combination of the right people to start something, but then there is this aspect that. The social media, you know, we've, I think in the last five episodes or so, we've had three or four that have really just talked about from a Dano's going viral from recipes in their kitchen. It is just given such a pathway, not only to really producing a brand, but then getting in front of major retailers for distribution as well. You know, it used to be such a door knocking industry to even be considered to get on shelf. And nowadays, I feel like the retailers are out there also looking for these brands that are being disruptive. Yeah, for sure. And, and in her case, uh, you know, writing writing blogs is hard, right? It takes a lot of time, but she, she's become a big part of that brand. Uh, you know, maybe you don't see it as much at shelf, but in the industry, uh, I'm sure that's all helping her as well. Yeah. And in the international space, I, know, I think she really hit on something is that with working with Blue Apron, such a strategic decision from, you know, being in a space with Indian cuisine, most individuals or consumers know that they can go out to an amazing Indian restaurant and have great cuisine. There, there's a barrier there that's, there's some intimidation with cooking in your house or bringing flavors in your house that maybe you didn't grow up with or you don't know how to infuse with your food. So to be able to take that partnership, introduce, have recipes built around where they could introduce and sample their product is such a strategic move on their part. On top of, I have to say, I was just looking at all their recipes that they have on their website. Um, go to brooklyndeli.com because you will be blown away. They've done an amazing job of not only giving such a nod to traditional Indian cuisine, but the infusion with, you know, some of Americans, um, favorites, a burrata and cheese, but adding in some of their sauces and so forth. So a fun play on some very American dishes, a cheeseburger, um, you know, a, a sweet and spicy cheeseburger. Very, very interesting. Yeah, that's cool. Like the, and, and somehow, you know, the creativity that she's bringing with those kinds of ideas, it doesn't really co conflict with the authenticity, at least not for me as a, a shopper of one. Um, you know, if, if anything, I'd, I'd rather buy from a small innovative brand. I would trust the experience more, I would trust that it's a real experience than buying from a, a big multinational in the space. Yeah. And she's creating a use case, right? If you're going to invest in a sauce or something's going in your refrigerator, it's not going to be something you're using once a month. Let's say for your traditional consumer, they may cook a couple of Indian dishes a month. You're investing in that and to be able to utilize it several times a week, meaning in your Indian dishes, but on top of maybe your family's favorite dishes as well. She's got a hack on ramen, a different way to play things. So I feel like sky is the limit for this brand. It's exciting to see a power couple of two really changing what Indian cuisine is and that providing a premium 
product out there to really educate us all. Yeah, I'm going to be adding a char to Taco Night for sure. You've been listening to CPG Launch Leaders, a show from Bold Strategies Incorporated. Don't miss the next thrilling launch story. Follow the podcast on your podcast player now. Please give us a rating, leave a comment, and share episodes with your friends. Until next time. Thank you.